Hey everyone, welcome to Crosswinds Church where we're all about the vision of growing closer to Jesus and going to our worlds. No matter who you are or where you're joining us from, there is a place for you here. If you'd like to attend one of our services, you can go to cwcmv.org forward slash sermons to check out the times, upcoming, as well as previous sermons. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the service. greatest areas where we see that goodness in action is in your word. Lord, you have given to us your word whereby we can know and experience the very words of life. And so now, Father, as we come to your word, would you open our ears to hear what you have to say for us? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart truly be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, for you are my rock and my redeemer. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Guy's uh, traveling along, and he's, he's kind of tired, and so he decides to stop and get some rest, and he pulls into, uh, he, he sees a park off the interstate, so he pulls into that park, and he parks and uh, puts his seat back and closes his eyes and uh, just about drifts off to sleep completely, and he hears this on, on the window, and he, he looks up, and there's a guy standing at the window. Not only is there a guy at the window, there's a whole bunch of people running past the car. And he realizes he's in the spot where there is a running path, and there's a, uh, obviously either a lot of people exercising or some kind of a race, probably not a race, but people exercising. And this guy's at the window, and he's, he rolls his window down, and the guy says, excuse me, sir, could you tell me what time it is? And he's like, uh, okay, it's, uh, it's 8.15. He says, okay, thank you. And he, he runs off. And the guy's like, oh, so he lays back again, closes his eyes, and, and is just about to sleep, and he hears another tap on the window, and there's another guy standing there running in place, and he says, could you give me the time, sir? He says, yeah, yeah, it's, it's 825. And he goes, all right, thank you, and he's off, and the guy realizes, I'm not going to get much of a nap sitting here like this, so he gets out a sheet of paper, and he writes out, I do not have the time, and he puts it up on the window, and that ought to do it, lays back down, closes his eyes. Sure enough, a few minutes later, sir, sir, it's 845. <laughs> now, we do live in a society that is, is very big on exercise, right? I mean, some people are anyway. And, and running was a big craze years ago. Still a lot of people do that. And this morning, we're going to see as we are continuing to learn how to build the church in the 21st century from this book that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to his young protege, Timothy. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. And uh, Paul wrote this to Timothy after he had established this church in Ephesus. And then he left Timothy to be the pastor of that church, and, and Paul went off to establish more churches. And we've been reading along with Timothy this letter uh, about how the things that, that are to, he, are, he is to do, things he is to expect. He, uh, Paul began with the whole emphasis on having good doctrine, good teaching in the church. He talked a lot about grace and mercy and prayer and all of these ingredients that go into building a good church. He gets specific at times. A couple of weeks ago, we saw the differences between men and women and their place in the church. Last week, we looked at the leaders. Well, we've been looking at all of this. Today, we're going to see that Timothy is, in a sense, going to get his running instructions. It's going to be sort of a, a running analogy, a, 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 a good uh, exercise analogy going on here. Now, it begins with kind of a contrast. You know, 
when, when Paul wrote this, he didn't put in chapters and verse numbers, okay? It was just a letter. It was just meant to be read from beginning to end. And so when I, when I say there's a sharp contrast between what Paul said in chapter 3 and what he be, begins with in chapter 4, realize they just follow one another, of course, in chapter 3, we have uh, the, verse 16 is just the previous verse to this passage. And, and he gives us that great confession of the faith, that great creed, if you will. It goes like this. We saw this last week. By common confession, meaning we all agree on this or should, great is the mystery of godliness. Remember, a mystery is something that was, was hidden and has now been revealed, and what is the mystery of godliness? Well, as we saw last week, it is Jesus Christ. It is the complete plan of salvation as it is experienced in Jesus. He, meaning Jesus, who was revealed in the flesh. Jesus, who was vindicated in the spirit. Jesus, who was seen by angels and proclaimed among the nations. Jesus, who was believed on in the world and is taken up in glory. And it's Jesus who we wait on today, who will return if we don't die and go to be with him first. This is the mystery of godliness. And, and, and a big part of that mystery that we saw last week is that godliness is not something that we achieve largely through our own efforts. We achieve it because of what Jesus Christ has done. And he sent his spirit to indwell us, to, to live within us, to empower us, uh, to, to do what he has called us to do. And yet, we call this the mystery of godliness, I think, because for so many, and I count myself under the, uh, in this group, so many of us struggle with this idea of doing it ourselves. I am a do-it-yourselfer. I, I'm, if, I always figure if somebody else can do that, you know, certain kind of automotive repair, certain kind of uh, work on a house, fixing a, 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 a washing machine like I did a couple weeks ago, if somebody else can do it, then I can do it. I'm a do-it-yourself kind of person. And let me tell you, uh, YouTube has been a boon to people like me. I mean, I figure now that if they have open heart surgery on YouTube, I can learn to do that. I won't have to pay those doctor bills. I'll take care of it. You know, Jackie, lay down. Let me, let me get the... I'll have Jamie assist, and we'll go for it, you know? <laughs> so, so I am a do-it-yourselfer. The, 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 the problem is when I begin to focus on doing it myself when it comes to my walk with Jesus Christ. And that is a big problem because I can't do it myself. That's why he sent his spirit. That's why he wants us to draw upon his strength and upon his power. So Paul says to Timothy, some people are going to abandon this great truth, this mystery of godliness, that God has already done it for you for something else. Some, he says, will run away. If, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's look at verse 1. It says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines or teachings, if you will, of demons. Now, the later times that he talks about here are between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The first time, of course, was, was uh, in that uh, Bethlehem manger. And then the second time is when he's going to return. So we are currently in the later times, as is defined here. The deceitful spirits, also known as seducing spirits. You see, what we have is Satan obviously wanted to destroy the church. That goes against everything he's about. And so what did he do? He brought persecution into the church. And it is estimated that upwards of 6 million Christians were killed for their faith in the early uh, first century of the church. Now, did it work? Obviously not. We're here today. And in fact, within 200 years, the church had become the dominant world religion. One person even said that the seed of the church was actually watered by the blood of the saints. So persecution didn't, uh, didn't stop the church. It actually accelerated its growth. And so what did Satan do? Well, he changed his strategy. And he decided, okay, if, if uh, trying to come against them, you know, strong arm tactics isn't going to work, then I will come against them in a more seductive way. And he began to lure the church into, into sleep, into lethargy. And one thing we see throughout history, uh, even probably in your own life, is it's tougher to be a Christian in times of pleasure and prosperity than it is in times of persecution, 
couple of years, a few years ago, Jackie and I were in China and had the opportunity to, uh, to be a part of some of the work being done in the underground church in China. And these guys have a vibrant faith. And in fact, China is exploding. You know, you think that, uh, you, you wonder if Christianity is going to last. Well, you go to China and you realize, yeah, it's going to last. I mean, there are thousands of people coming to Christ, realizing that in that country, Christianity is essentially outlawed. Yes, they have a, they have a Christian state church, but it's not necessarily evangelical, even though there are evangelicals working in that. So we can be praying for them. But let me tell you, the underground church is vibrant. It's exciting. It's growing. And then we come back to the United States and we see a place where we kind of take our faith for granted. Like, you know, well, we do this all the time and it's, yeah, I may go or I may not go. I mean, you know, I, I, I may be a part of things or maybe not. It, we, we've been lured to sleep and we realize that, man, it is so much more vibrant there in China. And that's the plan of Satan now. We're told in Scripture, and one of the ways that he lures us is through these false doctrines, these false teachings. They'll fall away from the faith because of these deceitful spirits. We're told in Scripture that we are to test the spirits. The Apostle John put it this way, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So realize that there are false teachings out there right now. I'm going to talk about them specifically in a couple of minutes. So what is the test of good or bad teaching? Here's what John says. By this, you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And that's the, the mystery of godliness, those things we saw. That Jesus Christ came. He lived on this earth. He died. He rose again from the dead. And he will return again. That's from God. And everyone who preaches and teaches that is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard that it is coming and now is already in the world. John Flabel, who was a Puritan uh, pastor, minister, author back in the uh, 17th century, he said this, by entertaining of strange persons, men sometimes entertain angels unaware. That's in Hebrews 13 too. But by entertaining of strange doctrines or teachings, many have entertained devils unaware. So how, just, how do these doctrines, these deceitful doctrines and teachings get to us? Look at verse 2. By means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Who are these hypocritical liars? Well, the word hypocrite actually comes from, it, 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 one of the meanings of it is an actor. An actor would be known as a hypocrite. He's playing a part. He's pretending to be something he's not. So sometimes I would, well, not sometimes, all the times, I would encourage you to be careful of people who seem spiritual, or especially people who seem super spiritual. Be careful of that. Be sure you test what it is they are telling you, as well as everybody else. But in, in, in those people that think they're super spiritual, that think I've really got it all together and you need to follow me, guys, if somebody really does have the truth, it doesn't puff them up, it makes them humble. In fact, the more you know, the more you tend to know just what you don't know. And that's, that's the mark of somebody. That's one of the things you will see, a characteristic in somebody that's giving you the truth. But check them out. Don't be fooled by the style or the smooth delivery. Remember, they're actors. And, and you know, you can play the part of, 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 of a man of God fairly easily. But the key is, what are they saying? What are they teaching? Study their doctrine. Let me give you some examples. There are doctrines out there that will teach you, for instance, that God is not involved in our daily lives. God does his God thing and we do our thing and never the two shall meet. There's people that teach that. There's, there's people that teach that God has already made all the decisions when it comes to salvation and otherwise. That God decides who goes to heaven, God decides who goes to hell, and the decision's already been made. On the other side of that coin are those that will say that God doesn't make any of those decisions. I make all the decisions. You make all the decisions. Everything that God does is directed by us. There's a big movement right now called universalism that says we're all going to heaven anyway. The Bible says, after all, that God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So therefore, that means that none are going to perish. Everybody's going to get saved. That's a deceitful doctrine, guys. 
And then there are those that would say, well, you know, I teach the Bible, but I teach it very carefully because you really can't trust all of the Bible. There's parts of the Bible that, you know, they're they're not meant to be taught. And and so they start putting question marks in places in the Bible. You can trust that. You can't trust that. It's amazing how when you start doing that, the things you can't trust are those things you really don't like or don't want to do. So how can people be fooled by this teaching? Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul said it to Timothy. He said, their consciences have been seared. Uh, another letter he wrote to the church there in Ephesus in, in Ephesians 4, he said, having lost all sensitivity, what happens? They've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. All because they have no sensitivity. Their skin has been seared. What happens when your skin is seared? What do you feel? You don't feel anything. There is no feeling. And that's why it's important that we not allow ourselves to become seared. It's kind of like calluses. You know, if you're a physical laborer, there comes a point where you want calluses because that means that you you don't get hurt in those spots. I'm a guitar player. I don't play very often. uh, And that means that every time I pick up the guitar, unlike the guys on stage, my fingers hurt for about the next day after I play it because these guys have probably got pretty tough calluses on the end of their fingers because they're, they're pushing down, on this hand, they're pushing down on those strings. And that's the key of being seared is you don't have feelings. And when you don't have feelings, you can do all kinds of things uh, that, without feeling bad about it. And that's kind of scary. I have people come to me and they'll say, Pastor, I, I feel pretty bad about what I've done. And I, when I hear what they've done, I say, well, good. Sometimes I say it out loud <laughs> because you should feel bad. What you're doing is a bad thing. And, and in fact, not only good, I'm glad that you feel bad. It shows that your conscience isn't seared. You still have a concept of what is right and what is wrong. Too often, you see, we, have a, we live in a society where we've turned bad things, things that God says are not right, we've turned them into good things or at least, at the very least, okay things. And so we talk about women's reproductive rights instead of talking about the killing of the unborn. We talk about things like, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I have issues with people and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I hate them. Whereas God says, well, no, you have murdered that person if you hate them. I mean, it, we, we redefine things. We make them somehow okay, at least in our own minds. And often what we're doing is we're running away. These are the biggies, though. I mean, you may say, well, you know, I'm not into uh, abortion or murder or any of those kind of things that, you know, so I guess I'm okay. No, don't be fooled just because those aren't your problems. There are all kinds of things. I could meddle a lot. What about lying? Even the little lies that you tell for people's benefit. What about the speed limit? What about, uh, you know, going back to that hate thing? You know, again, scripture says, if you hate somebody, you've murdered him. We have agreed that these things are, well, these are okay. That's just life. That's the way thing is. And when you start thinking that way and living that way, guess what's happening? You're losing your sensitivity. Your heart is becoming seared. And when we begin to do it with each other, trust me, we're doing it with the Lord. Jesus, or, Jesus said that you cannot love God and hate your neighbor at the same time. We're running away. Let's understand that right from the start. What should we do about it? Well, in, in the beginning of Timothy, Timothy said this, the goal of this command, the command that he was giving was to uh, stop the false teachers. The goal of this command is love, which what? Comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith, a good conscience, a conscience that still feels things, even though it might not feel good sometimes, a conscience that still understands that there is a right and a wrong, and God says, do it this way, and that means I ought to do it. A sincere faith, not a hypocritical faith, a real faith. Don't run away. And now he gives us some specifics about what they were actually doing. Verse 3. These men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of big words. If you have the note sheets out, I encourage you to write these down. A couple of big words, legalism and aestheticism, okay? Legalism, you might know. I'll, I'll define them very simply. Legalism means a person who is a legalist will say, my rules will save me. I've set up all these rules, and I'm going to follow all these rules, and by by following these rules to a T, I will be saved. 
And then a lot of what Paul is talking about here is a, is a, a lifestyle known as asceticism. And asceticism says, my severe self-discipline will save me. I'm going to be so good. I'm going to, I'm going to do more. I'm going to serve more. I'm going, to, I'm going to do whatever I do for the Lord in such a big way that, that, that God is going to have to accept me into heaven because I've given up so, more, so much for him. I've served so much for him. And yet these guys, Paul says, are running away in a big way, the aesthetics. What did Jesus teach when it comes, you know, they talked about abstaining from foods and, and, uh, and forbidding marriage. Jesus taught in Matthew 15, it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth. This is what defiles the man. So it's not the foods that you eat. In the, in the first century, of course, the Jewish people had all kinds of dietary laws, and, and that was okay. They served a number of purposes, but when they got to the point where the purpose became that by eating this way, God will then, will then shower favor upon me. I will be saved by, because I am eating the way God says to. Jesus says, uh-uh. It's not the, the stuff that you eat that saves you. It's what comes out of you or that defiles you. It's the, it's the things that are within your heart that defile you. What did Paul say to the Colossians on this same topic? He says, if you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, Galatians, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion. In other words, we look up to people and go, wow, that's quite a thing he's doing for the Lord there. And in self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. There's a time and a place. Now, let me just say this. We're, we're talking a lot. You could define a lot of this as the spiritual disciplines. And, and spiritual disciplines, when used correctly, are good things. Fasting is spoken of in Scripture and is advocated, and, and a number of us do it regularly. And fasting is a good thing when it's a spiritual discipline. But fasting doesn't make you better than other people. Fasting doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, improve your standing with God, right? The Pharisees taught that, or at least they lived that. If you're walking along one day in the first century and you see a Pharisee coming towards you, and maybe he looks kind of down and pale and, you know, uh, worn out, and they say, uh, Brother Joseph, what's, uh, what's going on? And he says, oh, my friend, I'm fasting, and, and, and fasting is causing so much pain and hunger, but I'm doing it for God, you know? Well, <laughs> the Lord says, no, you're not doing it for me. You're doing that for yourself. You know, you just got your reward. You just got whatever you hoped to get out of fasting. That was it right there when you promoted yourself. Because, in fact, what it should promote is humility. That's why Jesus says when you do it, do it silently by yourself. Verse 4, for everything by cre is created by God is good. Nothing is to re be rejected if it is received with gratitude, for it is sanctified by the means of, word, of the word of God and prayer. Unlike the legalists and the aesthetics, Paul says that everything God created is good. Now, this doesn't mean that we can just go off and, and, and abuse everything that God has created and given to us. I mean, sex is great when it's used in its proper place and time. But if you pervert it, it becomes lust and adultery and fornication. Food is wonderful. It's a, a blessing from God. But gluttony abuses that gift that God has given to us. And, in, and, and we run the risk during those times of running away. He says here, it is sanctified. It is made holy, if you will, by the word of God of, and, and uh, prayer. We are to celebrate our liberty uh, and pray constantly and give thanks through prayer and thanksgiving. Guys, the extraordinary, uh, the ordinary, I mean, becomes extraordinary. We begin to see God in everything. It's why I think it's important that we say grace at meals, because if for no other reason than to, to, to be reminded that God has provided everything, even this meal that, you know, I might be tempted to think I'm providing it today because I plunked down the money. No, we thank the Lord for being able to uh, partake in this. So some will run away. The next group that Paul talks about is some who will go into training. 
Paul, again, is going to use one of his favorite analogies uh, in the Christian life, and that is physical games, running, exertion, training. And this was very apt for the church there in Ephesus. There was a 100,000-seat uh, Colosseum stadium in that, that city. I think it's still there to this day, uh, at least what's left of it. And so uh, sports were a big part of their society. And of course, it's still huge today. Some people say that, that the Super Bowl is the most significant event in America throughout the year. So Paul tells Timothy, this is how you should train. Verse 6, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. So Paul is telling Timothy here, remember Timothy is this pastor, and Paul is instructing him on how to effectively pastor this church. But guess what? We're all reading this as well. He's talking to all of us. We're all ministers of the Gospels to our worlds. And so Paul tells Timothy and us to point these things out. This is good teaching. This is, this is good doctrine. It's made a difference and will make a difference in people's lives. We grow through this truth, he says, working on us from the inside, not necessarily through some spiritual discipline that comes in from the outside. The truth in us should, in, should then produce actions on the outside. So he tells Timothy what not to do. He says in verse 7, have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. An interesting phrase for the you know, fables fit only for women. <laughs> we, we call them today old wives' tales. And what's an old wives' tale, if, you, if you've never heard that? It, it's basically a truth that is almost unquestioned, because this is what mom said. And if mom said it, it had to be true. Well, a few years ago, I read an article in Reader's Digest that said 20 old wives' tales that you better not believe anymore. Let me give you an example of some. Don't swim for an hour after eating. That's an old wives' tale. It, there's, no, there's no proof of that. Uh, don't cross your eyes. They'll get stuck that way. I can hear my mom now. The five-second rule. Trust me, guys, if you drop food on the ground, doesn't mean you can't eat it. I do it anyway. But don't, don't fool yourself. There's bacteria on it. They get on it real fast. <laughs> Five seconds is plenty of time for, for probably thousands of them to get on there. So, so the five-second rule, mom telling you, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Eat it. That's just her saving money. <laughs> if you... Or it's her, in my mom's case, it was her giving the excuse why she's eating it because you know, I get some of that ice cream. Uh, don't go outside with wet hair, you'll catch cold. Not true. Feed a cold, starve a fever. I want it to be true because, you know, I like getting fed. But anyway, let me give you some examples of some worldly fables that are still out there today. And you'll recognize a lot of these. Have you ever heard this one? People talk about the basic goodness of man. We trust in the basic goodness of men. And when I hear somebody say that, and if I have an opportunity to interact with them, I say, could you give me some examples of that? Because, uh, and then, you know, they'll usually give me, you know, this guy did a nice thing here, and that guy did a positive thing here. But I said, you know, in general, the, the, the story of man seems to be how bad he is, and that lines up pretty much with Scripture. There's a, a worldly fable in, in the sense that there is no hell. Ever heard people tell you there's no hell? A loving God wouldn't do that except that it's pretty well clear in the Bible that there is. How about, uh, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, that novel, The Da Vinci Code, and I had a conversation with somebody that says, now I've figured it all out. This novel has told me what the whole Bible is about. Oh, my goodness. Talk about a worldly fable. We had quite a discussion after that. How about this? You ever heard somebody tell you, the Bible is full of contradictions. You can't trust it. Always, always ask them to show you one. I'll guarantee you, most of the time, they won't be able to. It's just something they heard or read on the internet. Or if they do find one, it can be explained. And, and if you can't explain it, write it down, bring it to me, and we'll go through it. And then you can go back and, and encourage them. God, here, here's the biggest one. God helps those who help themselves. We've all heard that one, right? The problem with that is that it is a worldly fable that is so insidious because it is exactly the opposite of what Scripture teaches. God does not help those who help themselves. God helps those through Jesus Christ because we can't help ourselves. That's why Christ came, because there was nothing I could do. That's what I had to admit, and I needed Jesus because of it. 
Now he gets back to what they are to do. You are to discipline. You are to train yourself to be godly. In 1 Corinthians, he uses an analogy that's real popular with Paul, that of a race. He says, do you not know that those who are in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? So therefore, run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, a trophy, if you will, but we an imperishable eternal life. (laughs) Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body. I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. What does this look like? I would submit to you, grow and go. Our mission statement. Grow in Jesus and go to the world. That's disciplining yourself. That takes discipline. We grow in Jesus through our our worship, through our fellowship, uh, through our discipleship, through learning more about him, our Bible study, our prayer. We grow in him, and then we go to the world in obedience to the Great Commission to make disciples. Guys, we need to make a study of godliness. I like that he says here, he simply says, discipline yourself. We're not told to try to discipline yourself, not to try to train yourself. I mean, you don't do that. Sadly, though, many people will say, well, I'm trying. I'm trying to live the Christian life. I'm I'm trying to walk the straight and narrow. Neil Wilson, a pastor, had this to say about that. He said, trying to live the Christian life implies and leads to failure. However, training to live the Christian life puts even failures to good use. What's the difference? See, when I'm trying to do something, my mindset is, I got to do this, I got to do this. And when I stumble and when I fall and when I fail, it's like, oh, well, I'm a failure. I guess I'm done. You know, when I'm training, then I realize that, okay, I may not make it. You know, if I'm, if I'm training and, uh, and, I, and I've done it in the past, if I'm training to run a, a 10K, for instance, and I may say, I'm going to take 30 seconds off my time this morning, and I get out there and I run real hard, and I only take 20 seconds off my time. I haven't failed. I've still built my body up. I didn't meet, match that goal, but I keep going. Even my failures become a part of getting me ready for that ultimate race. And that's the difference between trying and training. When you physically train, guys, nothing is wasted. And it's the same spiritually. That's the, that's the essence of uh, Romans 3, uh, uh, 828, which says all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean you go out and, and fail at things. It doesn't mean you fall flat on your face. But realize that when you do, you're not done. God just says, get up and start moving again. You know, ask forgiveness, get right with me, be filled with the Spirit, and just keep on going no matter how many times you've fallen. Amen? And I, and I, I say a hearty amen to that because I'd have been out of ministry right from the start had that not been the case. So we're training for godliness. Verse 8, for bodily discipline is of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life, but also for the life to come. Now, exercise isn't wrong. It's, it's a good thing, but there needs to be balance. There needs to be perspective. Uh, according to a recent study, I'll just give you some example. I, I like this one. According to a recent study, it said that for every hour that a person exercises correctly, you actually will gain an hour in your life. Now, the more I thought about that, because something wasn't adding up in my mind, The more I thought about that, I thought, wait a minute, I'm gaining an hour of my life, but I spent it in the gym. So what's the trade-off there? Plus, when I gain an hour of my life, where am I gaining it? I'm gaining it on the end of my life. So I may grow up to be a 95-year-old guy instead. You know, if I could somehow gain that hour in my 20s or 30s, that'd be awesome. I say that, and I'm being facetious, of course, but the fact is, you know, we, we spend all this time to, to get ourselves looking good, and if that's all we're focusing on, we've got some problems, because the truth is, once you die, if you don't know Jesus Christ, all you're going to be is a really good-looking corpse in that, in that box. And yet, that's what Paul says, spiritual training goes off into eternity, I love the way Pastor John Corson puts it. If you know John Corson, he loves wordplay. So here's a good example of, uh, of Corson's wordplay. He says, there is indeed a little profit in bodily exercise. It's a good thing, but not nearly as important as exercising oneself in godliness. If you have to choose between working out and worshiping, opt for worship every time. 
If you have to choose between Bible study and bodybuilding, always go with Bible study. It's good to jog and to do deep knee bends and presses and curls, but I wish people would put the same emphasis on jogging their memory of Scripture, bending their knees in prayer, pressing on the faith, and curling up with a good book, the Word of God. <laughs> Wouldn't you love to sit under his preaching? He, he, he does a lot of that kind of stuff. And it's, kind of, it's memorable. That's good. Physical training, guys, is a good thing. I don't want you to hear me saying that, you know, don't, don't worry about your bodies or anything. In fact, it's so good that in September, we're going to be hosting a health fair here at church just to encourage you uh, in how to better take care of those bodies. They are the, the vehicles, they're the meat suits that God has given to us to be able to, to move around and do everything else. You know, if I'm going to go to the world, I've got to be able to get up on my feet and walk there, okay? And so we, physical training is very good, but it's always second to spiritual training. Christians today want to be on God's Olympic team quite often, but they don't want to train. So some will run away. Hopefully, many will go into training. But then thirdly, some will run after God. Paul is emphasizing what he just said in verse 9. He said it's a trustworthy statement that deserves full acceptance. Godliness has value for this life and it has value for the next life. It's profitable for all things. Verse 10, for it is, this we it, for, it is for this we labor and strive because we have fixed our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Some people have uh, downplayed the whole concept of spiritual discipline. They say spiritual disciplines, that's, that's legalistic. That's aestheticism that I talked about earlier. But again, the, we have to have perspective. We have to have balance when it comes to these things. The issue is, why am I disciplining myself? You see, I don't labor and strive for eternity. I do so because of it. And guys, make no mistake, it's tough. It's, it's difficult. The, the Christian life, living the Christian life is not an easy thing. It's not supposed to be. Jesus promised us that in this world we will have trouble, but he says, but take heart because I have overcome the world. That's why they call it training. But at the same time, our hope is not in our training. It's not in our race. It's not in my efforts to accomplish whatever it is I think I'm accomplishing spiritually. It's in the living God. It's in the Savior of all men, Jesus Christ. And I have hope, which is a certainty, that I know he's coming. I have a, a hope, much like the athlete who trains. Why? Because he knows there's a competition coming up, and he's got to get ready for it. And he's, he's got a hope for the game that's coming up. Or the actor who says, you know, I know that there's going to be a, a, a production coming up. There's going to be a performance, and i got to know my lines. i got to hit my marks. i got to do everything right. And, and so there's hope that, that he's going to be a part of that production. Now, personally, I'll just tell you, I, I, I do physical activity and I do acting, and I don't like physical training and I don't like uh, rehearsing, but I do them because I know that, that they're going to be necessary in order to be better at what I've been called to do. And I have hope, meaning a certainty, that it will. Do you have that hope? What are you doing this morning? Are you running away from God? Or maybe, hopefully, you're in training for him. Getting, uh, getting prepared, getting, getting ready, and then going out. Or, and, and in doing so, then are you running after God? Paul tells us in verse 10 here that Jesus is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. In other words, God through his son, Jesus Christ, has offered salvation to every one of us. Now, I shared this with somebody this past week, and the question they gave me was, salvation from what? What are you saving me from? Well, the answer is sin. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us follow God's standard for life. None of us are perfect. Amen? Amen. I mean, we don't have to really spend a whole lot of time on that. Anybody's going to say that he's sinless. Uh, we've got a whole different line of, of reasoning. But I have met, I've never met anybody that said he never did anything wrong. And so that's what we're being saved from. Why? Because in Romans 6, 23, what does it say? The wages of sin is death. That's pretty hefty fine for something that just seems so natural. But there it is. But, he says, you don't even have to pay, pay that because the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And God's love is so great, guys, that he wants everyone to have this. What did he say? That, uh, that, 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 he, that uh, God offered salvation to everyone. 
He wants us all to have it. Look at his love for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And his wish is that everyone would have it. I think I quoted this verse earlier, 2 Peter 3. The Lord is not slow about his promise, for as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But as verse 10 says, only those who believe are saved. Only those who have received him, or as John says in, first, in John 1, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So God is offering that to you this morning. If you have never taken advantage of this opportunity to experience the life of Jesus Christ within you, experiencing new life and a new existence and a new way of, of seeing the world and your life and, and, and everything, He's offering that to you. He's offering it to everybody, but it goes to those who believe. How do you believe? Well, we call it ABC. First off, A is you admit that this is what I need. Yes, Lord, I've been hearing from your word. Yeah, I am a sinner, and I, and I do. Uh, I, I am under that condemnation. I, I do realize that, that uh, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm, I'm going to be I'm separated. I am separated from you right now. I'm already living an existence without God. I need someone to bridge that gap. I need someone to pay my fine. And then you realize the B is to believe that Jesus Christ is the only one who can pay that fine. He's the only one who came, lived a sinless life so there was no penalty on him, died on a cross, and rose again from the dead so that we could do the same. He died for us so that we can also rise with him to new life. He did it all. Believe that. And then finally, choose to make his life your life. Choose to accept that gift. As Romans 10, 9 says, that if we uh, confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and it is with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And guys, no amount of activity on our part is going to accomplish that. That's the plan of salvation, the only one. No matter what other doctrine or false teaching or worldly wisdom you may have received, that's the one way right there. None of us can do enough to earn salvation. It's a free gift. But once we have it, and that's where Paul's going with this passage, we're on the team. And then the challenge is to train and to effectively run our race. And it'll be rough. It'll be a struggle. And so we need to be in prayer. In fact, speaking of prayer, uh, 15 years ago, we started a prayer meeting here called Before the Throne. And we started it based upon a quote that I had read by Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan uh, preacher. And he said this, catch this, meet in monthly prayer groups on a sustained basis for seven years and then pause to evaluate what God has done to determine if you should keep on. And that became the, the, uh, uh, the motivation for us to start a prayer meeting. And we did that. We prayed weekly for seven years, and then we stopped at seven years, and we say, is it worth it? Has God answered? And boy, we had all kinds of answers, all kinds of encouragement. And so we kept on, and we've gone on now uh, for another eight years beyond that. We're into our 15th year. And so I, I share that because sometimes we don't think that long term. We live in an instant society. You know, we put the, we put the thing in the microwave and I got to wait a whole minute and a half for my food to be done, you know? And, and, but spirituality isn't like that. It takes time sometimes, <laughs> most of the time. And, and so we have to, to work at it and we have to stick with it and we have to press on. I remember... Uh, well, and I know, you know, times when I've been training for certain things or when I've been walking or losing weight, I've I'm, I'm been uh, eating healthy and, and doing exercise for the last couple of weeks. And it's hard sometimes. It hurts. But there's benefits from it. You know, you see, if I, if I feel better like I do today, I, I can do a better job at preaching. I can go longer. So eat, will you? Have some ice cream, right? <laughs> And I do, and I feel awesome. And I, 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 one, of the, one of the motivations for realizing I need to get my, you know, my, my health under control was that I was wiped out at the end of Sunday. If you wanted to talk to me after church, it's like, yeah, come to my office while I lay down, you know, <laughs> and you can talk to me there. But, you know, that's, that's not been the case for the last uh, couple of weeks. It's been exciting. 
But if we press on, guys, ultimately we will win. I have a, a plaque in my room with a quote that's been attributed to Calvin Coolidge. And it goes like this. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education alone will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. No, it's persistence and determination alone that are omnipotent. Now, that's a great statement except for the last line. <laughs> persistence and determination alone. Uh, fortunately, as Christians, we, we, we can be persistent and we can be determined, but we can also be encouraged because we're not alone, right? Amen? We got the Lord Jesus Christ. We got the Holy Spirit within us. And so I like the way Paul puts it even better in Philippians when he says, I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I don't regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. In other words, I'm not perfect. I still make mistakes. I still fall down. Amen? I mean, that's where I'm at. Maybe I'm alone. But one thing I do, he says, and this is key, forgetting what lies behind, that is so key, guys, because if there's anything that will stall somebody, it's that, man, I keep screwing up. I try to do this thing, and I fall down, and I try to do this thing. And how many times have I talked to somebody about, about stepping out, you know, and challenging them to something, and they say, no, you know, I've tried that before. I've tried that three or four times, and I fall down every time. You know what my advice to them would be? <laughs> Press on. Keep going. Forget the failures and turn around. Press on. I press on, uh, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And what lies ahead? Jesus Christ. Keep your eye on the prize. Look what we're heading towards. He says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And that's the call he has for us, guys. That's what spiritual disciplines are all about. They don't save us but they're part of that, that, that maturing process in our lives, part of the way he builds us and molds us, part of what we are as a body of Christ when we're bearing each other's burdens, when we're praying for one another. Why are we doing those things? Because quite often, as I'm walking, I've stumbled and I've fallen and I, and I can't get up, you know? And so we're here to help each other up in that great thing called Christianity, in that church. We're, that, that's how we're building this church of Jesus Christ. Let me give you a couple questions and then we're done. Number one is this. Going back to the, begin, the opening of this passage, am I paying attention to any false teaching? Pay attention to the things that are coming into your life because sometimes those things that you just, be, it just becomes a habit in your life even though it's not right. It, it's interesting as I've gotten into small groups and, and, and opening myself up to accountability partners, there's things that they'll bring up and they'll say, you know, I see you doing this. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I've, I've been doing that so long. It's just a, it's just a pattern. I remember one time uh, uh, driving along. I, I mentioned the, uh, the speed limit. That was a particular one for me. Uh, I was driving along one time, and I had my young daughter. I'll go ahead and name her because she isn't mine. It's Wendy. And uh, <laughs> Wendy's the big rule, rule keeper, and you learn that with her. And so uh, we're driving along, and, and Wendy says, Dad? what's the speed limit around here? And immediately I look at my speedometer and I realize I'm going about 10 miles over the speed limit. And I said, uh, it's, it, it's 55. And she goes, how fast are you going? And I said, I'm going faster than that. You know? And she was gracious. She didn't press me. You know? If it had been me, I'd have said, no, tell me, how fast are you going? You know? <laughs> and, and, it's, and it's like that you know, with accountability because there's those things. I wasn't even thinking about that. But so you know, I was paying attention to false teaching that it's okay to do that when it's really not, those, those little things and the big things. Secondly, number one, uh, another one, uh, what's my plan for godly fitness? How are you building yourself up? How are you uh, exercising? How are you pressing on, as the Apostle Paul said? I would submit to you that these cards are a great tool for that. You will be doing a lot of the spiritual disciplines. You can pick these up in between the doors as you exit the, the, uh, the foyer today. And if you have these cards and if you're following through, you're praying for people, you're looking for opportunities to impact their lives, you're preparing yourselves, you're, 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 getting decide, you're, you're, you're making sure you're getting teaching and training so that you can be a more effective uh, impact in their lives. So that's a great tool for, uh, for godly fitness in your life. And if you haven't done that, I encourage you to pick one up and read through it and follow through with what it says. One more. Have I, in fact, fixed my hope on the living God. 
Honestly ask yourself, what is my hope in? Is my hope in my bank account, my retirement plan, my, my children, my husband, my wife? Or is my hope in the living God where it ought to be? None of those other things deserve you putting that much hope in them, particularly your spouse or your children. Don't put your hope in them. Put it in the only place where it ought to be, the living God himself. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word today. Tough, Lord. This is, this is hard stuff. Uh, training is, is not easy, but then it's not supposed to be. That's what makes it training. And yet, Father, you have provided for us an entire body of believers that's why we're here for each other. We, we encourage one another. We bear one another's burdens. We, we pray for each other. We, we, uh, we love each other. And Father, I thank you for that. It makes building the church in the 21st century something that is actually possible rather than that, that unattainable goal that some people think Christianity is. Yeah, our goal is perfection. But this side of heaven, I'm, I'm never gonna get there, but I can do the best I can and, and, and the journey itself is the exciting part. Just, just living this life, Lord, that you've given to us. So I pray, Father, that we would not allow our hearts to become seared. We would, we would be open to, to feeling and to discerning, even when it's tough, even when it hurts, to realize what I've done. Lord, at those times, may I not uh, focus on my past failures. May I, may I forget them and turn and focus intently on the goal, which is you, which is your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the tremendous gift you've given to us in him. And I pray, Father, that as we consider that, that would prompt in us a desire to give back to you as well, to give you our, ourselves, our service, our, our, our attendance, our prayers, whatever it is, Lord, to just serve you in whichever way you've called us. And of course, Lord, to give financially. Lord, we pray, we give so that this message of hope and encouragement doesn't just stay with me, but it goes literally to the entire world. We thank you for that and the privilege and opportunity of being a part of that as well. For we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Here at Crosswinds Church, we believe this vision of growing and going can change your life and the world around you. Crosswinds Church is a nonprofit, which means it operates from gifts given from people just like you. When you give, your money goes to creating opportunities for people to grow and go all over this world. I would love for you to be a part of that. And you can give a gift right now by clicking on the Give button in the top right corner of this page. Or you could go to cwcmv.org forward slash give. Join us in what God is doing through this vision of growing and going. And have a great day.